and sickness, darkness, Jesus, you got me through my addiction, depression, every mountain move, and I God bless you, and welcome to the Defending the Message podcast. I'm your co-host, Pastor Jesse Smith, and here's our other co-host. I'm Amen. On today's podcast, we're going to look at a testimony of one of the believers in our church named Brother Austin. We felt burdened to share people's testimonies because we know it will be the help to other people. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimonies. So hopefully in the next few episodes, we can get more testimonies of some of the saints in the church and post them on podcasts so that people can listen and be encouraged. And we know every time that we talk about Jesus, sing about Jesus, think about Jesus, he comes near. And the Bible says, wherever two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst of you. So we know talking about Jesus, testifying of Jesus, it blesses everybody and it brings the presence of the Lord. And so we're assured that Brother Austin's testimony will be a great blessing to you today. So let's get into his life and see how the message of Jesus Christ has made a tremendous difference in fact, has made all the difference in his life. We'd also like to give a warning here at the beginning of this podcast that this episode has a lot of mature content, so we do not recommend children listen to this episode. Our brother Austin has a powerful testimony because God reached down and rescued him out of a life of despair, even from the beginning of his life because Austin was conceived in an act of rape and then grew up in a home full of domestic violence and drug abuse. So during this podcast, you'll hear different drugs mentioned, such as alcohol, cigarettes, marijuana, LSD, hallucinogens, Vicodin, Xanax, acid, and also the selling of drugs. You'll also hear that that Austin's high school had students who would bring guns to school. And of course, as Christians, we do not support drug abuse, domestic violence, or any other gun violence, but we felt it was an important part of Austin's testimony showing how God's hand reached down to him in the depths of despair and rescued him, transforming his life completely by the renewing of his mind, according to Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. We felt some of these details from Austin's life would help certain individuals who have been trapped in drug abuse or domestic violence, and his testimony would give them hope that God never leaves nor forsakes anyone, and God is rich in mercy and mighty to save anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We also hope you'll listen all the way to the end and you'll hear Austin sing a song about this particular aspect of his testimony. The Lord gave him a song called Right Where I'm Supposed to Be. And in the song, Austin talks about overcoming depression and suicidal thoughts. And the song magnifies the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ to rescue him, save his soul, and lead him into paths of righteousness for God's name's sake. You heard a small portion of this song at the beginning of the podcast as well. And with that, we'll get started. Bless you, Brother Austin. Great that you're here with us. Okay, we're going to start with the first question. What was your childhood like in relation to learning about Jesus? Hey, uh, God bless the listeners of this podcast. Um, my childhood in relation to learning about Jesus. Uh, I grew up not really real, super religious. Um, I kind of went to church just a bit as a kid. I went to Baptist church, but I didn't really take it serious. I was kind of there just for the candy, for real, and the fun stuff they would do. You know, my mom and dad didn't really push God on me at all growing up, so I didn't I didn't really have any opinion about God or any true knowledge of Jesus. Like, my church as a kid kind of just taught me that once you're saved, you're always saved. Just, you know, I remember a day in church, they were like, do you want to accept Jesus into your heart? And I was just like, yeah. And they are like, all right, let's pray. And they are like, pretty much just told me that if I just am sincere in his prayer that I accept Jesus into my heart, that I'm saved, and now I'm going to heaven no matter what now is what they told me. You know, I'm, I'm saved. I'm a believer now. So I walked away from that. I was like, okay. I was like, cool. I'm going to heaven now, you know, no matter what. And I'm saved. It was my candy. So, you know, I just, so I didn't really go to church that much as a kid. It was just a little bit. 
But I went on my own accord, though. Like, I guess my mom told me I would just tell her I wanted to go to church randomly. I just started going sometimes. But so, yeah, pretty minimal, minimal knowledge of Jesus growing up as a, at least a small child. You said something there really important, brother, that most churches teach that salvation is only one work of grace. So they teach as soon as you say a sinner's prayer, a scripted prayer, they teach that you're saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, born again, full of the power of God, and yet that's a huge error. And I recently preached on that, well, I think last year I preached on that, and the Holy Spirit just really brought that to my attention, like, that is an awful false doctrine. Mm -hmm. And you experienced that. I would say I experienced a similar thing when they, when I was in Assemblies of God and they told me to say Jesus over and over again until I blabbered some words out and then everybody rejoiced like I got the Holy Ghost, but right. I didn't. I was crying and I was emotional because of all the loud prayers, but then I stuck a sucker back in my mouth and ran back outside to play baseball or whatever sport I was going to do. So I just thought I would share that for our listeners to know that the churches, most churches are preaching a watered down doctrine and a scripted prayer doesn't change the heart. It's when a heart really repents. That's when a heart gets changed. Yeah, I remember when I was learning about Jesus in the church and when we would pray, the prayer meant absolutely nothing to me as a kid. Like, I, there was no emotion tied to it. It was like an a empty prayer. You know, it just, I was just saying words. You know, it was like I was just reading a book that I didn't like or something. You know, it was just, it meant nothing. Like, just emptiness. I had no, I was just saying it basically to get candy, so... And I believed it enough to keep going to church. You know, I believed Jesus was real, but he wasn't real to me. By the, the church didn't make him real to me, and they just didn't explain anything. I, would, I was always confused, you know. Sunday school was confused. They just taught the basics, God loves you, and Jesus died for your sins. But they didn't tell me how to repent or what repentance is or what even sin really is, you know. Or they didn't really teach me anything. You know, I just learned the basics, like God is good, he loves you. Uh, don't sin, you're saved, you're going to heaven. That's it. I was just like, okay. And, and as a kid, you know, not really going through a lot of things anyways. Uh, I had really no need for Jesus. You know, I was a pretty happy kid for the most part. So I just, you know, it, was, it wasn't real to me until later on in my life. So I'd be pretty much my childhood was just pretty much lacking, lacking real knowledge of Jesus. Amen. Can you share that experience where... Your mom said you woke up and you talked about going back to heaven. Mm. Oh, yeah, that's crazy, yeah. Uh, I guess when I was, like, two years old. Um, yeah, this is real young, yeah. This is way back. I was two years old, and my mom said that I came out of my room at, like, 3, 4 in the morning one day, and I and I just, middle of the night, just woke up out of my sleep and, and went to the living room. And, and looked at her and told her that God told me I was from the stars and that when I'm a teen, he's going to take me back home. So from that point, you know, I don't know how old I was when my mom first told me that, but I remember not believing her, you know, and she said she wrote it down in her journal somewhere, you know. And, and like, so my whole life, she was just super overprotective of me, especially when I turned 13, you know, because teen, you know, so she thought I was going to die. She took that as, you know, I was going to die because... You know, it sounds like if God's going to take you home, you're going to, you know, you're going back to heaven, you know. So she thought I was going to die. So super protective. And long story short, we'll get to the, the journey, but long story short, short, when I turned 19, I was introduced to the message, you know, and that's when I really got the knowledge of God. And like, amazing, amazing story on how I even found the message. So, yeah, so it was like a prophet, prophecy, you know, early on in my life that came true. One of many. It was pretty crazy, yeah. Pretty Amen. crazy prophetic thing that happened there. It's almost like a uh, prophecy for your life. Yeah. So coming from the stars makes it sound like coming from heaven or coming from the mind of God. And Ephesians chapter 1 says we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. And actually Abraham's seed is likened unto the stars. God told Abraham, your seed is going to be like the stars, the number of stars that they are. Mm -hmm. So that's a very spiritual dream there. And then going back home, home would represent heaven or going back to the mind of God or coming back to God's original plan for your life. Right. That's what that was, too. It wasn't death. It was life. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Beautiful. Do you want to share about some of the mental things, like just in general terms? Yeah. 
I went through a lot of things mentally as a kid, really. Like, physically, everything was kind of all right, but mentally, I mean, it all started, I mean, at birth already, I was already beating odds, right? Like, it goes hand-in-hand -hand with being from the stars, because at birth, my mom was raped, so, and she kept me. And the doctors told her she only had a 25% chance of ever even having a, a kid. So when, you know, when she was pregnant, she kept me, you know, and she feared that she wouldn't love me, but she said as soon as she had me, she fell in love, so that was good. And then, so, already off the bat, you know, that's like God's ordaining everything in my life, so. But growing up, you know, it was pretty, pretty crazy in my house. You know, like, outside, I was kind of like a happy kid, but inside, I had a lot of demons I was battling from long as I can remember, really, so there's a lot of... <coughs> My stepdad was around since before I can remember, and he was a crazy alcoholic. He did drugs and stuff, too. He used to beat my mom. You know, they'd be arguing almost, I don't know, every night I can remember in my childhood, there was a bad, terrible argument in my house, like, terrible. I mean, it's not your average argument, you know. It's ter terrible things. And I just remember being scared all the time as a kid. Uh, I remember somewhere along the lines, getting a sense that I needed to protect my mom, like, as young as five years old, probably, I remember having to feel like I, I need to protect my mom and stuff, and always being obsessed with, like, keeping my mom safe, which a normal, you know, a normal kid is, that's not their first priority, you know, I mean, everybody, every kid's like, oh, I love my mom, I love my dad, but it, this was, like, a deeper need to save my mom, you know, protect my mom. Uh, it was probably because of what was going on, you know, I saw what was, my dad was doing, I felt helpless, you know. But then, since he was my dad, I thought I had to respect him, and I thought this was normal. You know, I, I would I would think that all people were going through this at home. You know, so I just so I didn't really talk about it with nobody, and I, I always felt embarrassed sometimes because we were always a family on the street. Like the arguments would be so bad, you would hear them. You could hear them all the way down the street. Like you hear my parents yelling. I was always that kid with the parents. So, oh, it's your parents. Parents are yelling again. You know, so it's kind of embarrassing growing up. So. We were like that crazy family on the neighborhood, you know? Yeah, so it was like that. So I used to always just, uh, I became like very sheltered and I never talked about my issues or nothing. I just pretended I, like everything was okay growing up. Never really was vocalizing anything to anybody. You know, I just held it all in. Uh, Cause I just thought it was normal. So I'm just like, oh, this is something everybody just gotta go through. You know, it's, it's nothing, you know, so it just, made me like super depressed but I, I had I feel like I had depression as a kid but I just didn't know I did you know because I'm, I'm too young to realize like I definitely had anxiety as a kid but I didn't know it as anxiety back then and then uh I used to have flashbacks or just I remember always trying to be a peacemaker with my parents because like I could sense the tension so I would always try to do things to be like oh just keep their minds off of arguing you know drinking and stuff and and so they're always drinking a lot, you know, there's a lot of alcohol, lots of alcohol. I hated alcohol as a kid. I used to throw beers away, tell my parents to just stop drinking. It was this bedlam. Hated alcohol. Yeah, it was like that all the way until high school, graduated high school even. Like it was my whole whole childhood since I can remember, which is violence. It's utter violence, really. I mean, the worst arguments you can imagine, dude, it's terrible. I, I could literally hear it right now in my head, my dad yelling, it's terrible, it's sick. It's a shame I have to remember him like that, but I forgive him, you know, but it's evil. There was one word from my childhood. I was happy at the same time, mentally it was also sad, like it was evil. My childhood was evil, but it was also very happy. I can't, ex sounds confusing, man, but I was a super happy kid, but it was also, when I had to go through that, it was just, terrible like I literally would be scared I'll be crying I would get up and go hide in corners and I remember my dad got me a dog he got a dog one time that helped me a lot so it's probably like you were happy all day except for when the arguments would start right? <laughs> yeah yeah it would be bad it would just wake me up in the middle of the night sometimes you know with stuff throwing breaking all the time plates glasses and stuff and like sometimes I would like you know hide some of my toys because I didn't want them to be broke, you know, or I would, I would like try to, try to hide under my blankets, you know, and just ignore it. I'd be scared, you know, and I always, always be so scared. I remember, uh, 
So when he got me my dog, I finally felt like I wasn't alone because it's like my dog got scared too. My dog would literally, when it happened, he would literally like be shaking, crying in the corner too. So I, I, I felt like I had a friend, you know. Yeah, there was one time, uh, my parents, you know, were divorced when I was, I think in uh, seventh grade. There was one time uh, my parents were arguing and uh, my dad that night, he never did it except for this one night, he went and bought some beer. He got drunk. And uh, I, I, I remember watching them and he took his hand and he knocked down all these glass jars. And I just, I can still, I can still see it. I can Ooh. still hear the glass, you know, and I was just like, <laughs> I was shocked. Yeah. Um, that's that's a really the only time though that I saw that to that degree. So I can, I can kind of, you know, um, understand a little bit you know just a little bit about that but just the impression that has upon a child now this will be important later on because we'll see how the blood of Jesus Christ right operates in your life and so instead of taking on the traits of your stepfather you take upon the traits of a Christian right and that's the power of the gospel amen So then when, when did you finally encounter God and finally surrender to Jesus? All right, so it's a good question. So it leads, you know, so coming out of that childhood, you know, I get to high school and ninth grade, I start, you know, you're a, you're a, young, you're a young dude. You're in high school, you're, you're introduced to all these new things, you know, new crowds of people. And I finally get my little crowd. I get into skateboarding real hard. It's just ways I would just I was super I would never be home really I would always be out and about skating with my friends just never trying to be home I hated being at home and I was not very close to my parents at this point in my life I barely talked you know I wasn't like I felt like my parents didn't even know the real me because I was so I didn't talk about anything you know and I just kind of shut out everything in the world like I just pretended nothing existed that was bad so it was like eventually it all caved in later in my life but uh so my whole, it feels like my whole life I've held everything in. So high school, I start high school, you know, and I, I start off really good. Half my year, I'm really good, you know. I'm, some of my friends, they'll start smoking weed and stuff, you know, doing cigarettes, all that, drinking. But half halfway through freshman year, I'm still the kid in the group that was just like, oh, I was scared. I was, I would be scared to hang out with some of my friends after school because I just didn't want them to be like, hey, try this. Because I didn't want to be the lame kid that would be like, oh, I'm not going to do it, you know. You know how peer pressure and all that, trying to be cool, and none of that really matters. But in high school, it's so important to you. So I would be scared to hang out with my friends after school because I thought they were reckless, but I really liked them, you know. And and they're a pretty good crowd, good cool crowd, like good values, not like really bad kids. It's just, you know, they, they're just smoking weed and stuff, just doing things reckless, like rebellious teenagers. But I remember one day, like halfway through my freshman year, I remember – like a week, I was just thinking like, all right, I'm gonna try smoking weed, man. So I started getting into music, really. Like music was always very important to me. And my stepdad was a musician too. So I grew up around music a lot and it was very important to me. I like would find therapy through music. I played music my whole life, but I started really taking it serious in high school and started making beats, like producing and all that. And I, I, one, I was just thinking about trying weed, you know, cause I'm, I'm just like, all right, I'm going to try it. And one morning, I remember, I woke up, getting ready for school, and there was a joint sitting on my table in my living room. And I was like, well, this is it. So I took the joint, I lit it up, smoked it on the way to school. And then I went to school, first period class, and I looked at my friend, you know, one of my friends, his name was Jared. I looked at him, and I was like, dude. I just smoked weed for the first time. I was like, I found one of my dad's joints. He must have forgot and left it on the table, and I smoked it. And he was like, no, he didn't really believe me. I was like, yeah, dude. I'm, I was just remember laughing the whole class and thinking it was awesome. You know, I'm just, ah. So here we are. I'm going through high school. That was my first introduction to drugs, you know. And so I start. That was like my first relief. I'm like, oh, I don't feel this pain anymore. I didn't realize I was depressed even in high school or had anxiety. I didn't know what it was at that point. But I just knew I didn't feel that weird feeling I was always feeling. You know, I could talk now. I could I could laugh. You know, I could I could be a personality again. You know, and so I started music sounded really good. So I started smoking a lot. You know, I started I was like, oh, I gotta get this. Started doing smoking a lot of weed. 
hanging out with my friends outside of school now. I'm like, you know, joining them, smoking weed. I started drinking a bit, but I didn't really like drinking because of my childhood. I kind of didn't really get into drinking through high school, just other things. But sophomore year comes, you know, I'm still, I'm still smoking weed, but then I get introduced. I start doing Vicodin, start doing Xanax, you know, we just pills would come and I would just take them. I start studying drugs because I just become infatuated with, with mind-altering substances and what they did to you. So I just became infatuated with it. So I just wanted to try everything So, because I didn't feel anything anymore. So I, I started doing lots of pills. I started taking pills from my mom, and she would think that the pharmacy was messing up, but it was really me. And... And, and, I, and I would go along with the lie. I would just agree, yeah, the pharmacy, you know, they're probably messing your pills up. Mom, it's terrible. Like, because I was so ashamed of what I was doing, going in her purse, taking her pills and stuff. And, but I was just, sometimes I would take her box wine and literally just to go to school, I would have to chug like three glasses of wine just to go, because I hated, I was so depressed. I hated going to school. I got bullied a lot sometimes because I was weird. You know, I was just that weird kid. Like, everybody liked, but also hated it. It was weird. Like, everybody hated me and liked me at the same time. I didn't get it. But it's because I was different. Like, I wasn't scared to speak my mind. So I would skip school a lot. My life started really kind of falling apart in high school. Yeah, so sophomore year, I introduced. I started taking LSD, a lot of hallucinogenics, you know. Start taking acid. I would take it in, in class, and I would tell my teachers, you know, like, what I'm on, what I'm seeing. And they, it was like a really, really really ghetto high school like I mean people had guns and stuff like people, my friends would bring guns to school all the time like be showing me their guns in the bathroom like so it was like a really bad school you know my teachers would let me literally smoke because I was actually really smart in high school I got really good grades and then they saw me as smart but it's just I just didn't apply myself I was just like the outcast kind of person you know but I was always kind to everybody because I was just sad so uh and I hated when other people weren't kind to people because I would get bullied sometimes, you know. I was just weird, you know. So, so yeah, I started taking LSD, drinking more, having parties, you know, just kicking it really hard. I tried a lot of drugs, but not really hard drugs until after high school. So I get senior year, you know, and I, I finally graduate yeah. with merit roll, too. My God, that's great. That's my merit roll. I graduate, and literally, and mind you, this whole time, my parents are still arguing, drinking. It's a wreck at home. I hated going home. I hated going home. I dreaded going home. And I would always be high, too, and I was scared to tell my parents. So I would just go straight to my room sometimes or just not even come home until I'm completely sober. And then I would come home and just tell them, oh, good night, going to sleep. And I'll wake up the next day and then, yeah, get high. So, so I graduate, and boom, literally probably a couple weeks after I graduate, my dad gets a DUI, so he's he finally is like, all right, I'm going to stop drinking, da-da-da. I have a problem, finally admits it. And then literally a couple of days after that DUI, he literally comes home super drunk, and I just went off on him, and I kicked him out. I was like, I'm done with this. Like, I just kicked him out of the house. But then, you know, we couldn't afford the bills, literally. Like, I was like, oh, man. And my mom was super mad at me, but also not mad at the same time, like, because she was just battling. You know how it is being abusive. Really. You love the person, but then you, it's not her fault, but. So after I kicked him out, realized we couldn't really pay the bills. So I had my friends move in, my friend Matt, my friend Spencer. And from that point, my childhood home, that house turned into a straight trap house. I mean, just my mom was super depressed, so she stopped caring about anything. I, I didn't care about anything. We just started doing all types of drugs, started selling drugs out of the house, had all types of people in all, all through the night, all the time. While my mom was literally just in the back, super sad, drinking, not even talking to anybody sometimes, or just kicking it with us sometimes, you know. And then uh, this is where everything fell apart. I mean, this is like the climax. This is 2016 now. I graduated in 2015. This is 2016. We were doing that for like six months, and it's not sustainable at this point anymore. It gets real bad. I mean, it was a whole bunch of stuff going on in that house. And then my mom started talking to this guy. And mind you, she was with my dad for like 18, 19 years. Abusive relationship meant mainly the whole time. And she had maybe been not with him at this point for a couple months. Met this guy, started talking to him, and she moved in with him within like two months. And just kind of left us all at this house a little bit. 
I mean, th she said I could go with them, you know, and live there, but I, I didn't really want to. I'm like, nah, I'm, I, I wasn't for it. I was like, mom, what are you doing? I, I didn't like nobody because I didn't trust anybody. So I was just mean to the guy at first. So eventually it, it, things came to an end. We lost the house, you know, and this is six months after I graduated. We lost the house and I was homeless. I remember I would just go downtown Akron, you know, I would just like sleep in parking decks. And while all that happened, I started, I picked up guitar and I started just teaching myself how to play guitar. I mean, I was so depressed. I was sitting in my room for hours straight. I mean, like eight, nine hours straight till my fingers bleeding, just learning how to play guitar. And I started learning how to sing because people told me I could sing. I didn't believe in myself though, but I knew I loved music. So I would go downtown and I remember I was being hungry and I would go and I told myself I would never beg that I had a talent, God-given talent. And, and around this point, I started kind of questioning God again. I was an atheist through high school because I'm like, God can't be real. I, I just went through complete uh, terror my whole life. I'm like, there's no God. Like, there's no God. I didn't believe in God anymore. I was like, no. So I remember one night, I would go into restaurants and I would play music and ask them if they liked my song, if I could just have a sandwich in exchange for me playing. And, most of the time, all the time, they gave me a sandwich, you know. I don't know if I was out of pity or if they really liked my music, but it was cool. But one night, I was sleeping in a parking deck, and I was tired. I was about to go home. I was gonna, I was going to walk home back to my house that we just lost, my childhood home that I grew up in. I was going to break into it and sleep in it because I wanted to sleep on carpet. So I remember in the parking deck, I just was like, all right. I just got down on my knees, and I just prayed how I knew how to pray. I never learned, but I just... Prayed from the heart. I was, I don't even remember what I said, but I was like, God, I was like, if you're real, why am I going through this? Can you reveal yourself to me? I was like, just show me you're real because if there's any point I need you, I need you now. I was like, I'm 19 years old going through, I feel like I was like going through the worst thing any 19 year old has ever been through, even though I know my struggles are probably nothing compared to other struggles, but it's just for me personally, it was the hardest thing ever. So. I, I pray that prayer. I'm just like, God, show yourself to me, please. Like, anyway, just show me that you're real. So I ended it with that. I went to sleep. I woke up, and I remember the next day I would just, you know, walk, just do my daily walks around downtown. And then when it got around nighttime, I was like, all right, I'm going to walk four hours across Akron to get back to my old house, and I'm going to go break in and sleep in it. And halfway through my journey, I walked into a Burger King, and... I just wanted some water. So I had my guitar on my back, you know. That's all I had, too, just my guitar and a little backpack full of a couple clothes. And I walk in just for a glass of water. I wasn't even hungry. And this guy comes from the back. And he's like, hey, man. He's like, he's like, you play, right? And I was like, oh, I have a guitar on my back. I play. And then uh, he's like, can you show me something? So I'm like, oh, all right, sure. So I started singing him a song, you know, that I wrote. And I didn't believe in myself, you know, so when I saw people's reactions and that they were shocked that I could actually sing or whatever, I would be shocked. I'm like, oh, you actually thought that was good? I'm like, oh, man, like, you're, I was like, you really think that's good? And he was like, just jaw dropped shocked. So he was like, man, he was like, where are you going? I was like, I'm just trying to get home, man. I'm, I, I got to walk four hours. He was like, here's some bus money. So I took the bus money, went outside, crossed the street. Waited for the bus. It was supposed to come at midnight. Never came for some reason. I don't know why it didn't come. So I walked back into Burger King, and I gave him his money back. And then he was just shocked that I walked in and gave his money back. He was like, you just came in here and gave me my money back? I'm, and I told him, I'm like, yeah, man, the bus didn't come. So, you know, you gave me the money. So I was like, here you go. And, and he's like, you know, nobody would do that. He was like, what? He was like. So I guess that was a big thing for him, you know. That for me, it was just regular because that's just who I like. I didn't think that was a big deal. Basically, he asked something. And I basically led to like I'm homeless, you know. I was actually just gonna go break into my old house so I could just sleep there. I got tired of sleeping in a parking deck. So he told me, he was like, "All right, man, look." He started showing me that he does music, you know, that he has all these connections or whatever. But just trying to show me that he could trust. I guess I didn't trust him at all though. But I, I was like. I was an opportunist, and I loved the adventure of life. So I was just like, all right. I didn't trust nobody, but he told me, he was like, listen, you can stay in my house tonight. You can stay in my house. I'm going to have my brother meet you at the bus station. So he met me at the bus station. I walked there, met his brother, went to his house. He got off at like 2 a.m. that night. He got home, told me he just got out of prison from four years three weeks ago. And 
showed me his music. But long story short, he told me that his grandfather was a preacher. And then him and his brother started talking about a guy named William Branham. And he was like, did you know we had a prophet? And I'm like, oh, we don't got no prophets. You know, it's ancient stuff. Like, oh, these guys are in a cult. You know, so he started telling me about, about this church, you know, and this thing called The Message. And I was like, huh, it's weird. And then a couple, couple days later, in comes Pastor Jesse Smith, right? And I remember the first conversation I had, the first sentence he said, I remember in my head, I was like, if there's any guy that's close to God, it's this man right here that I've ever met in my life, it's this guy. And then I was like, okay, God, I'm like, is this you answering my prayer? Because, I mean, the way I just met this random stranger just let me live in his house. And from then on, we became like brothers, like him, his brother, and me, like brothers, still talk to this day. And I lived with him for months at this point. He helped me get on my feet, taught me how to drive, you know, helped me learn a lot of street street knowledge, you know, and like taught me a lot of, a lot of things about life, about music. He was the first person besides my parents and my friends that really believed in me, that told me you're going to be, you know, a good singer, you're going to be this. And I didn't believe in myself. I didn't believe him, but I still kept pushing on. And now, now, you know, I believe in myself in a godly way, not pridefully, but just like I, I accept I have a gift and I could sing and play. So after I met Brother Jesse, that's when, you know, I didn't believe it at first. I thought it was a cult. My mom thought I was in a cult because I've never heard none of this. But I guess that's when I finally was really introduced to Jesus. And that's when I first developed my real relationship and I entered the message, and, I, and then I repented, got baptized. You know, I heard all this stuff, and I was like, yep, that's God answering my prayer. I'm like, there it is. I was like, you're real. So I, I believed it ever since, and that was, that was how I really got introduced to Jesus. That's how I needed him, yeah. But it took a long road of pain to get me to that point. So that's how it happened. That's how I was introduced to this message. We're ending our first part on this testimony as there's many more stories we want to hear from Bar Austin and we're going to record the second part in our next podcast. And we want to thank you guys for listening to this first part. As we close, we want to play a song Brother Austin was given by the Lord recently that he sang as a song special at a recent church service in Napoleon, Ohio, and it's called Right Where I'm Supposed to Be. I know it'll be a blessing to you. God bless you and may Jesus Christ anoint you to defend the message. Okay, cool, cool. Hey, God bless you. God bless you guys. Hey, um, so I'm, I'm, the Lord gave me this song, um, actually last week. So I wanted to sing it in hopes that it's a blessing. Um, cause I've never done it. Yesterday was my first song special, so I'm just doing this for the Lord. The Bible says to share our gifts with the congregation to bless others that is not our own. So I'm getting past my nervousness and I'm sharing it with you guys. Um, and this is a song about my testimony, so it's a little different than yesterday, so I hope it's a blessing. Thank you. I was broken, the devil had a hold on my brain. Bottle after bottle was drinking away my pain. The pills I would take were an overdose away from funerals and R.I.P.s. I just wanted to feel anything at all that put my broken heart at ease. And I was losing control. Right where
are, then I'm right where I'm supposed to be. Suicide haunted the thoughts in my head. I would hide my feelings of sorrow from all of my friends. Suffered in silence, I felt more alone than being lonely could ever get. My childhood of violence and my broken home gave me trauma I couldn't forget. And I... sickness darkness jesus you got me through my addiction depression every mountain moves and i yourself known and you answered my call there is power in your name there is power in your name oh yes you are jesus christ emmanuel i'm holding on to you through my sickness darkness ever got me through my addiction depression every mountain move and I Thanks.